acknowledged any involvement in a 1961 meeting of the board of directors at Berkshire Downs, and he showed his only trace of anger about his run-ins with the law. The only thing I can answer to my knowledge, in 61, I was sick with a hot condition. In the early part of the year, I think it was in March. So I know, and I had Dr. White for my doctor, died from Boston, and I know I wasn't attending no meetings or going no place with a hot condition. And I still got the hot condition. That pulling races for him. Uh, were there other jockeys that you put the pressure on? Yes, uh, these uh, jockeys that were uh, Puerto Ricans, Argentinians, and, you know, they all looked the same to me, they were little, and they had long hair, uh, you know, I, I don't know their names. But uh, one of them particularly, that Henry told me to grab, he said that the guy owed, uh, owed a $1,500 tab, and I pulled out a knife, and I put it near his throat. I said that I was going to slice him, and then Henry Tamil came in and said, uh, what's this, what's going on? You know what I mean, hey, Joe, get away from him, he's a good kid, you know, you know uh, what are you, crazy? And uh, I, I walked out of the courtroom. Henry Tamilio stayed in there with a, with a jockey, maybe 15, 20 minutes, and he came out and he had another jockey that was going to pull horses for him. Barboza was matter-of-fact in describing gangland murders and was not hesitant about naming names. Uh, Roy French was very concerned about uh, getting caught in a crossfire, so he shot Deegan in the head first. Louis Greco opened up, and uh, Romeo Martin came out and started firing, and the last part and shot that... Uh, Dean Gutt was uh, when Romeo bent over and gave him one in the head. One of the biggest misnomers on YouTube is when people take a stance at informants or truth telling and they've come to Jesus, they've reformed and are different men and, and somehow they're all maligned and finally doing the right thing, putting evil men in prison. But the reality is that that's simply not true and it's not accurate. 98% of all informants have reoffended, committed crimes while under the watch of the FBI. And in all cases, these informants have made millions upon millions of dollars for testifying against their former friends. Some of these men are still reoffending today. So the adage that men reform, men change, and become good men in most cases, but not all, is utter bullshit. Uh, there are, you know, 0.2% of those guys who don't reoffend, and those are just facts. So the scale is weighted on one side. And this is not a rat bashing event, but I wanted to correct many of the inaccuracies that have been repeated on YouTube. The fact is, if you removed money and forced these men to do time, most wouldn't waste their time testifying against their friends. Additionally, none of these men decided prior to go into prison that informing was a great idea. It's always after they get into trouble. And those are just the facts, whether anybody likes it or not. And while I don't agree with informants on any level, and I never will. The one thing I can say is the gaps in what is truthful versus what is accurate is far and deep. Most content creators do not understand the depths of the FBI's misconduct. Instead, we often see padded excuses for informants and people try to weave and bob claiming that this rat is nicer than that rat or this rat is smarter than that rat or this rat is more honest. A rat is a rat is a rat. You cannot distinguish between any of them. There is no middle ground. Anybody who plays that fence, with all due respect, does not have a stance. And they don't have to. But that's just the truth. So what we're going to talk about tonight directly will refute this odd belief that informants are honest. And that the FBI is about justice, integrity, and honor. Three of the biggest garbage pails the FBI ever produced were in H. Paul Rico and DeVecchio and John Connolly. All three should have died a miserable fucking death in prison after what they did. All three allowed their informants to murder and prodded them into committing murder. H. Paul Rico thankfully died in prison for his role in greenlighting the murder of Roger Wheeler for Jimmy Bulger. Lynn DeVecchio helped assist Greg Scarpa in locating people to murder, and John Conley helped bury murders. 
All three are repulsive piles of shit. And still to this day, other than John Connolly, the FBI still backs H. Paul Rico and DeVecchio, calling them heroes. So in New England, in Boston and Providence, we've seen one of the most disgusting miscarriages of justice when it comes to street guys. The story is vast, the corruption is far-reaching and wide, and this is why I told all of you that Whitey Bulger didn't give up nearly what people think he did. And it's my hope that you'll understand why after we get done with this. This is an 1,800-page volume of corruption and just some heinous stuff. And it's not easy to condense into an hour. And that's what I'm going to try to do. So I'm not going to go through every single plot point. I'm going to stick to the meat and the potatoes of what we're talking about. And this case that we are going to talk about is so massive. You know, like I said, we can't cover it all, but I want to keep the crux of the important stuff. And the misconduct will make you fucking sick. And it totally negates what content, content creators spew. And while the argument will be, well, this is just one case, but there is a history of this. There is a history of the FBI doing this sort of shit. This is not a one-time thing. And if we accept this to be the truth, which it isn't, or excuse me, which it is, <laughs> then how can we accept anything that they say at this point? Where there's smoke, there is fire. And I'm going to begin simply by stating a teletext memo from J. Edgar Hoover to the New England Organized Crime Task Force, as well as the Boston Police Department. And he states that informants lying, the end justifies the means. And that's J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI, acknowledging that informants are lying on the stand, putting men into prison on lies, but it's acceptable to end organized crime to allow them to do this. And the problem with Hoover is he never realized that down the, down the line, all of this corruption uh, and that of the FBI was going to be front and center. So Joe the Animal Barboza was a Portuguese hitman for the patriarchal crime family. Now, while he is doing time in Wapole prison is when he meets a bunch of gangsters. And upon his exit from prison in 1958, he begins his life with gangsters on the east end of Boston. He basically runs a small robbery crew and eventually catches the ISDV Flemmy. And Barboza becomes the go-to guy for mob hits in the Patriarcha crime family. Eventually, he also gets in deep with the Winter Hill gang because of Stevie Flemmy and Vincent Flemmy's friendship with Buddy McLean. As early as 1965, Barboza was talking to Special Agent H. Paul Rico. And while he hadn't turned an official informant at first, he begins to break the street code and he actually attempts to shake down a bar owner that was already paying protection money to Gennaro Angelo. And Barboza was a reckless guy and repeatedly got attention the wrong kind of way. And so by 1966, he gets arrested with two others and they get arrested on weapons charges outside of the combat zone in Boston. While his two partners get bail, Barboza didn't have $100,000 for his bail, so he sends word from prison that he needs help from the patriarch of crime family, and they refuse to help him because he was a troublemaker. He couldn't stop putting a target on everybody, so they said, fuck him. And based on that, Barboza decides to go snitch. This is why he becomes an informant, other than the fact that he gets caught in a bunch of murders and doesn't want to go to jail for that. But... It wasn't until 1967 that he becomes an official cooperator. And that's where this story sort of begins. So H. Paul Rico, the special agent, would turn Barboza into a federal informant. In the mid-1960s, Washington had to focus on Boston and Providence, specifically Raymond Patriarca. And the Bureau began a course of conduct that is considered the most, one of the most egregious acts in FBI history in terms of organized crime. And most of this is going to hinge on the murder of Teddy Deegan in 1965 and the six defendants who were charged and convicted of that murder on the words of Joe Barboza. All the while, the FBI was protecting him, Vincent Flemmy, and Stevie Flemmy. Keep in mind, uh, Jimmy Bulger and Stevie Flemmy were government informants who murdered 19 people while under the protection and jurisdiction of the FBI, Special Agents Rico and John Connolly. So in 1968, Joe Barboza would testify against six men for the murder of Teddy Deegan. You can go look up Teddy Deegan for yourself, but Peter Lamone, Joe Salvati, Louis Greco, and Henry Tamello were all indicted for that murder. On March 12th of 65, Deegan's body was found shot five times in the back of the head in an alleyway in Chelsea, which, as you know, is a working class area just outside of Boston. 
Uh, the 35 year old had a long criminal history, was also suspected in a $40,000 holdup of a local mob connected bookie, ends up getting lured there on the pretext of participating in a lucrative burglary. At the time of that murder, there was a wiretap placed within Raymond Patriarca's office, and both Barboza and Jimmy Fleming wanted to kill Teddy Deegan. In fact, Vin- Vincent Fleming was complaining about the Deegan's be- was complaining about Deegan's behavior at a nightclub called the Revere Nightclub. Flemmy tells Patriarca he wanted Deegan dead, and Patriarca essentially greenlights that murder. Not two days later, Deegan gets clipped. The FBI knew, and they did nothing to protect Deegan whatsoever. Uh, Raymond Patriarca, despite greenlighting the murder, would never be indicted for that murder, and that's a big thing. Because if he is the alleged boss and he is agreeing to someone murdering somebody, shouldn't he be indicted for that murder and charged? But he never is. Why? Well, for starters, the FBI didn't indict him because they knew that once this went to trial, that a discovery, discovery motions would happen and a tape would come out, which would show the FBI knew about the murder and did nothing to stop it. Number two, it would refute the official story that Barboza would tell under oath at the murder trial of Teddy Deegan. So one day before the Deegan hit, Jimmy Flemmy was signed up as a government cooperator, and that's not just coincidence. And it's important because Jimmy Flemmy actually participated in the murder of Deegan, and this was the FBI protecting their asset. Another one who participated in that hit was Barboza himself. However, Special Agent Rico and Condon would help Barboza tailor his testimony to keep Stevie and Jimmy Flemmy out of prison. The fact that Flemmy and Barboza committed that murder uh, and also the fact that the Chelsea Police Department had witness reports that basically refuted everything Barboza would actually testify to, that evidence and those reports were buried by the FBI, which typically under law, under discovery, would have been handed over to both the prosecution and the defense attorneys at trial. And it would have shown that Barboza was in fact committing perjury on an epic scale. And six men, two of which who were sentenced to death, likely would have been actually acquitted. That microphone tap in Patriarch's office would refute Barboza's testimony and the information about why Deegan was going to be murdered, and it proved that Barboza was lying, but the FBI hid that tape. The tape. This is what the crux of the tape was. Joe Barboza would request permission from Raymond Patriarcha to kill some unknown person. This person lives in a three-story house, but Barboza had never been able to line him up and kill him. Barboza tells Raymond Patriarcha he plans to pour gasoline in the basement part of the house, set it on fire, and either kill the individual by smoke inhalation or fire, or in the event he starts to climb out of a window, Barboza would have two or three individuals with rifles kill him as he started to step out the window or door. Upon questioning by Raymond Patriarcha, Barboza says that he had planned to cut the telephone wire so the individual could not call for assistance and also ring false alarms in other sections of the city so that the engines could not respond quickly. He also would explain that the third floor apartment was vacant, but the first floor apartment was apparently occupied by the intended victim's brother. And this apparently caused no concern to Barboza, who stated it was not his fault that the mother would be present, and he would not care whether the mother died or not, or whether children were involved. Patriarcha gets mad and tells him that is not a good idea, uh, and that killing in that form and fashion is not what they did, and innocent people should never be hurt. Uh, it was not clear to the informant whether Barboza accepted Patriarcha's objections to the murder. A Patriarcha indicated very strongly against any type of killing in this fashion. So, in late 1964, the FBI learns from an informant that Jimmy Fleming wants to kill Teddy Deegan. Two, two days later, October 20th of 64, Deegan was called and warned that Flemmy was looking for him and that Flemmy intended to kill him. Five months later, between March 5th and March 7th of 65, Jimmy Flemmy meets with Raymond Patriarcha and asks permission to kill Deegan. That request was renewed a few days later on March 9th of 65, when Flemmy and Joe Barboza visit Patriarcha and explain that they're having a problem with Teddy Deegan and desired to get the okay to kill him. Flemmy stated that Deegan is arrogant, he's a, a nasty sneak, and should be killed. That refutes what's on the tape. They're two different things. Barboza's saying that this is really what happened, but meanwhile, the FBI has the tape knowing there's another reason for this and what's going on. So Barboza is lying, and the FBI knows it. Um, 
So let's see. So Barboza visits. Uh, okay, blah 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 blah. Uh, an FBI agent who prepared this memorandum about the microphone surveillance noted that Flemmy and Barboza requested permission to kill Deegan. He also stated that Raymond Patriarca ultimately furnished this okay. But if you listen to the tape, Patriarca really doesn't give the okay. He says, "No, you're not going to do something like that." Perhaps as important is a handwritten note prepared by FBI uh, Special Agent Rico monitoring the conversation between, or not Rico, excuse me, uh, an FBI Special Agent who was monitoring the conversation between Flemmy, Barboza, and Patriarca, and it indicates that Flemmy's motive for killing Deegan was tied to the mclean McLaughlin gang war, and that Flemmy was particularly concerned that Deegan, Deegan fills Peter Lamone's head with all kinds of stories. Reporting on his contacts the following day, FBI Special Agent Rico writes a memorandum explaining that an informant told him that he had just heard from Jimmy Flemmy and that Patriarca had put the word out that Deegan was to be hit. None of that's true. On March 12th of 65, Deegan gets killed. Recording his contacts the day after the murder, Special Agent Rico writes a memorandum based on information obtained from an informant. The memorandum describes the Deegan murder in detail, including information that Jimmy Flemmy provided to an informant. Flemmy admits that he was one of the men who kills Deegan. And this is important because the previous day, the day the Deegan gets murdered, Jimmy Flemmy officially gets assigned to Special Agent Rico to be developed as an informant. Uh, over the course of the next few weeks, at least nine descriptions of the Deegan murder were prepared by federal, state, and law local uh, enforcement officials. Each of those descriptions provides details of the murder substantially different than the uncorroborated testimony provided three years later by Joe Barboza when the matter finally went to trial. Unfortunately for the defendants in this case, relevant information was covered up by the government because they failed to disclose all uh, to all the defendants the exculpatory information that had been captured by the FBI's microphone surveillance of Raymond Patriarca. And even more unfortunate than that, federal officials failed to step in and prevent Joe Barboza from committing perjury. Even though it was a death penalty case, four men received the death penalty. Two of them received a sentence of life without parole. So uh, on October 25th of 67, Joe Barboza testifies before a Suffolk County grand jury. And the information that he provides is totally contradicted by the information already known to federal officials which renders Barboza's testimony completely suspect. And it's inconceivable that federal law enforcement officials didn't know what Barboza was going to tell the grand jury and what he, what he did tell the grand jury because they sit with prosecutors, they're coached, they're told what the, you know, how to say things. So it's, it's likely at least you know, some federal officials understood that Barboza committed perjury and didn't say a fucking word. So Barboza did not provide any information to the grand jury about Jimmy Flemmy and Flemmy's involvement in the Deegan murder because he was a shooter. More important, however, he explained that he and Ronald Cassesso planned to take credit for the murder and that the only person beside himself who knew what was going to happen was the office and the only other person involved was Ronald Cassesso. Barboza was asked, so the only one this time, okay, excuse me. Uh, so the only one at this time that knew you were doing this for the office was Ronnie Cassesso. Barboza replied, yes. And that testimony completely avoids the fact that Barboza and Flemmy have visited Ray Patriarch not three days before the murder to get his fucking permission. It also avoids the fact known to the FBI and memorialized in an FBI memorandum authored by H. Paul Rico that Jimmy Flemmy had told an informant that Raymond Patriarca has put out the word that Teddy Deegan's going to be hit and that a dry run had already been made and that a close associate of Deegan's agreed to set him up. None of the stories are the same. Thus, Barboza's story about he and Casessa were the only two that knew Patriarch had been consulted was obviously bullshit to anybody who had knowledge of the FBI's microphone surveillance of Patriarch uh, and who had access to the informant who Jimmy Flemmy had confided. And this information was not provided to the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office and consequently, it was not available at the time when Barboza's credibility was being assessed as someone to give testimony. Barboza would state that Peter Lamone first approached him in February of 65 to hire Barboza to kill Deegan. And yet when Barboza and Flemmy 
uh, approached Raymond Patriarca in March to seek his permission for the Deegan murder. All indications are that this was the first time the subject had ever come up. Furthermore, the microphone surveillance captured no discussion about Peter Lamone's involvement whatsoever. One FBI memorandum suggests that Patriarca told Barboza and Flemmie to consult with Gennaro and Julio about their intention to kill Deegan. But it's highly unlikely that if Lamone had already offered money to have Deegan killed, that either Barboza or Flemmie would have even bothered to ask Patriarca for permission to kill Deegan and failed to have told him that had they already been contracted. So if you've already been contracted to kill a prick, you don't need to go get the boss's approval. Unbelievable. So according to documents provided by the Justice Department, Lamone and Deegan appeared to be on good terms. A few months before, Lamone allegedly hired Barboza to kill Deegan. Lamone gave Deegan two guns. The following month, after a hearing that Jimmy Fleming wanted to murder Deegan, Lamone warned Deegan about the murder threat. More importantly, three days before Deegan was killed, Flemmy tells Raymond Patriarca that Deegan fills Lamone's head with all kinds of stories. Thus, Flemmy seemed to be indicating to Patriarca that the reason to kill Deegan was that he was close to Lamone and that he was the source of all kinds of gossip and stories. Barboza also provided information that makes it fully appear that his testimony was coached. He stated that before Deegan was murdered, he was at a bar called the Ebb Tide. He noted that the bar was very crowded, and he states that when he left the Ebb Tide with the people that he implicated in the Deegan murder, others also left the bar at the same time. He recalled that others who left at the same time uh, were, the, were men named Femia, Ciampa, and Imbruglia. And it's difficult to believe that Barboza would be able to recall more than two and a half fucking years after the fact the precise names of those who actually left the bar at the same time he did. More to that point was the existence of various reports and informant descriptions of how Femia, Chiampa, and Imbruglia were involved in the Deegan murder and had actually been part of the conspiracy to kill Deegan. So when Barboza was falsely describing how one set of people involved in the Deegan murder, he also attempted to provide an explanation that diminishes the importance of the information known to a number of federal, state, and law enforcement officials. So if any police reports about the Deegan murder had been admitted into evidence at trial, Barboza would have had to have an explanation regarding those who left the ebb tide at the same time he did, and coincidentally, whose name appeared in police reports about who participated in the Deegan hit. So it appears that Barboza's testimony about how Femia, Chiampa, and Imbruglia coincidentally left the ebb tide at the same time uh, he did could only have been given if police reports and informant information had been shared with Barboza prior to his testimony. In other words, hey, we need you to say this. Here's some police reports. These are guys that were seen. Add their names. This is exactly what he does. So when Barboza does testify at the Deegan murder trial, he explains that he was pro approached by Peter Lamone on January 20th of 65 and that Lamone offered him $7,500 to kill Teddy Deegan. Barboza then testifies that the office had approved the murder and that Henry Tamelo, who was involved in the murder conspiracy, and that Tamelo was involved as early as January of 65. The FBI's microphone surveillance, however, did not provide any evidence of a January approach to Barboza, but it did provide evidence that Barboza and Jimmy Fleming did approach Patriarca in March of 65 to seek his permission to kill Deegan. Thus, the dates don't even match. And Barboza's story that he was approached with an offer of money for a contracted murder is opposed to the reality captured on tape that Barboza and Flemmy sought permission to murder Deegan because he was an arrogant, nasty sneak and should be killed. Federal law enforcement officials, the only officials with access to this wiretap information, appear to have purposely kept this information from prosecutors who tried the case and sought the death penalty for six defendants. So in the period between Barboza's first recorded meeting with the FBI agents Rico and Condo, Condom, Condom, <laughs> Condon, uh, his testimony in Suffolk County prosecution for the Deegan murder, Barboza meets with either Rico or Condon or Edward Harrington 41 times. When Barboza finally does testify at the Deegan murder trial between July 2nd and July 11th of 68, there were a number of discrepancies between information available to law enforcement at the time of the Deegan murder and Barboza's testimony. 
and the three most significant involved the absence of Jimmy Flemmy, who was there and used a weapon, the chronology of origin of the murder plot, and the use of a forty-five caliber weapon to kill Deegan. So, the absence of Jimmy Flemmy from Barboza's testimony is the single greatest indication that we have that Barboza was lying. And it, just as Im- important is the addition of Joe Salvati to the pa- to the fact pattern described by Barboza at trial. Salvati's introduction to the list of defendants is significant because just before the crime was committed, an eyewitness who also happened to be a fucking cop saw some what saw some men who killed Deegan in the vicinity of the crime. The eyewitness described a man who had an appearance exact to Jimmy Flemmy. Thus, Barboza was confronted with the dilemma. Minutes before the Deegan was murdered, someone saw a man with Barboza who looked like Jimmy Flemmy near the scene of the crime. And what's more important is this was recorded in a fucking police report. Jimmy Flemmy was Barboza's best friend. who was a frequent accomplice in all of his criminal endeavors. So it wouldn't have been unusual for Flemmy to have been with Barboza to begin with. But Barboza solves this dilemma by adding Joe Salvati to his story then testifying that Salvati was wearing a disguise, which included, among other things, a wig that made him appear bald. <laughs> As described by Barboza, Bar- the disguise made Joe Salvati, who in real life looked nothing like Jimmy Flemmy, resemble Flemmy. So for the jury, of course, you know, it, it might have seemed believable but only because the jury was never given any evidence that Jimmy Flemmy was involved in that crime or that Flemmy had any motive to kill Deegan because the FBI hid that tape. So for the federal law enforcement officers who had access to the evidence that Flemmy was a part of the Deegan homicide, this story should have indicated that Barboza was not telling the truth. Barboza was also aware that he had been observed leaving a popular nightclub with a number of individuals just before Deegan gets killed. And all of the written reports compiled by law enforcement at the time of the murder, nobody had placed Salvati at the nightclub. Nobody indicated that he left with Barboza. Nobody indicated they ever saw him. Well, Barboza solves this inconsistency by testifying that Salvati was not with him because he had asked Salvati to go warm up the car some 90 minutes before the murder takes place. Just ridiculous. And a jury, you know, might have believed it because they're not being handed a tape. They're not being shown the police reports. All of this was hidden. It, 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 crazy. So less than two weeks after De- Deegan was murdered, the, an informant tells the FBI but that Barboza claims he shot Teddy Deegan with a forty five caliber gun. Two years later, on March 21st of 67, Barboza was interviewed by Special Agents Rico and Condon. Although the documents provided to the committee that did this investigation are redacted, a significant focus of this interview was the Deegan murder and Joe Barboza's knowledge about that murder. On the same day that Barboza was interviewed, March 21st to 67, a Boston newspaper would indicate that Barboza appeared before a federal grand jury. Responding to that activity, a memorandum was drafted in the, uh, uh, by J. Edgar Hoover stating the following. A review of the Bureau of Records reveals that no investigation of Barboza was ever conducted by your office. In view of the current circumstances, the Bureau should be cognizant of all background information. Thus, you should submit to the Bureau an investigative report per instruction set under the Criminal Intelligence Program containing all background and identifying data available. Uh, The Boston office complied with the instructions from Washington when Thomas Sullivan transmitted a memorandum to Washington, which summarizes information about Joe Barboza. In that memorandum, the Boston office restates the information from two years earlier. An informant state that Barboza claims he shot Teddy Deegan with a 45 caliber weapon. Barboza indicated that Roy French was with Deegan and another individual when Deegan was shot by Barboza and two other individuals of whom the informant believes was Romeo Martin. So here you've got Washington had other intel saying that these guys had nothing to do with this, that Barboza was responsible, Flemmy was involved, and two other guys, but they bury it. Uh, Barboza's grand jury testimony states that not only did he not shoot Deegan, but he also did not see who shot Deegan. Obviously, it's a factual discrepancy, and it should have been lost to nobody on the jury or to the prosecution. So the reality is, the feds buried everything. Innocent men were convicted. Meanwhile, before the news broke, other informants had told the FBI they got it wrong and that Barboza had lied and that agents had coached Barboza and helped him to lie. 
And yet the FBI disregarded that information. And so as information begins to come out in the 1970s about this cover up and the corruption and the lies, the defendants the entire time are trying in vain to get appeals, to get clemency, because they have proof that the agents lied and Barboza lied. Yet judges refuse to believe it, stating that while there might have been uh, some form of perjury, they were evil men and justice was done. This is what judges said. And Joe Salvati at this point had already done 30 fucking years and repeatedly through an attorney and affidavits, uh, he wanted commutation of his sentence and clemency, especially with the facts surrounding the case that had been coming out. Yet it would take until 2001, 68 to 2001, unfucking real. And it turns out you guys are going to love this part. The FBI stepped in to control the parole, the parole advisory board. Because, see, there's a whole step to getting clemency. You put the information before the, 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 the clemency board, the parole board. They vote. You get one no. You're fucked. It's got to be universal. Then that goes to the governor. And then the government can say, based on the recommendations, we're going to give you clemency. This is how this works. But the FBI was much slicker than I think a lot of people. <laughs> they're, they're such scumbags. But it turns out what the FBI does is they step in to control the advisory board votes to ensure that Salvati could not get out. And they did this multiple times to every single defendant in this case. Two members of the Boston Police Department would even step forward to help, saying that the government lied, that the conviction was wrong. They have police reports that say otherwise, but the board didn't care. 10 to 12 commutation hearings, all denied. And when he finally gets clemency, which was only one step because it has to go to the governor. The FBI steps in again and they tell the board that a visitor to Salvati was a known loan shark. The mere fact that they went that far to keep Salvati in jail on murder charges that he didn't do is disgusting. So what does the board do? They deny Salvati again. So once it goes to another, so then there's another vote and it finally is unanimous. Yes, clemency. It goes to the governor. William Weld, the biggest cocksucking rat piece of shit fuck that's ever existed. And you know what he does? He refuses to give Salvati any reprieve, even with all of the information contained. And the governor would cite, ready for this, Salvati's lengthy record in career criminal, and this is why he's denying it. But the only thing that Salvati had ever been found guilty of in his fucking life was was uh petite larceny he stole a pair of fucking pliers and he had a couple parking tickets he didn't have a criminal career he was not a career criminal but this is what the motherfucking governor of massachusetts says and this is your fbi at work this is what they do Peter Lamone, same thing happens to him. Same end. However, Lamone would sue the FBI and get $19 million for the shit they pulled on him. But it doesn't matter. He still did 30 fucking years in prison. Three of the six defendants died in prison. Three of the six died in prison on a conviction they were not guilty of. And the FBI doesn't care because remember, J. Edgar Hoover, the ends justifies the means. Then in the 1980s, the FBI pulls the same bullshit on Rudy Schiara and Raymond Patriarca. They try the same fucking thing, but the same thing happens. But those defendants get lucky. And because of this case, we're able to get underneath of it. Eventually, Agent Rico leaves the FBI and becomes the vice president of High Lie. And he green lights the murder of Roger Wheeler. Yeah, real special people. So the FBI does nothing as the men were convicted and sentenced to life in prison, knowing that four men, Salvati, Lamone, Greco, and Tamela, were all innocent of the Deegan murder. And they were in possession of the tape that proved it, which actually implicated Barboza, Jimmy the Bear Flemmy, of murdering Deegan. Tamelo was 84 years old when he gets out. Greco, 77, died in prison. Excuse me, Tamelo and Greco died. Tamelo was 84, and Greco was 77, and they died in prison. Vincent Flemmy dies in 79, 
In the late 1990s, the complicated relationship between the FBI, the Fleming brothers, Barboza was revealed and it proved that Barboza was intentionally committing perjury and falsely implicated four men with the coaching of corrupt FBI agents Condon and Rico, which led to the exoneration of Lamon and Salvati, who were already at this point in their late fucking 60s. Two men fucking died in prison of something they didn't do. And apparently it was far more important for the FBI to protect rats than the lives of innocent men and their innocent families. Uh, Lawyer Victor Garo, who represented Salvati, later told reporters while in Boston and D.C. that the FBI took the attitude that the convicted men were guilty of something. So convicting them for a crime they did not commit was fine, but it did not meet the standards of American justice under a supposed democratic civilized society. Lamone Salvati and the estates of Greco and Tamela received jury trial settlements of $101,750,000 for the FBI's complicity for fraudulently convicting them. And those same fucking agents, Dennis Condon and H. Paul Rico, and their mentors, John Connolly and Michael Buckley and Robert Cowan and John Agent Orange Newton, James Ring and John Morris were all part of of the Vinnie Marino case. Look that up for yourself. And they applied that bullshit of corruption and witness tampering and manipulations against Marino using the United States, uh, uh, the A- AUSA Jeffrey Auerhorn and Cynthia Ann Young to do their bullshit bidding. Years later, FBI agent Conley gets indicted and convicted of the murder and sentenced to 40 years in state prison after his conviction for racketeering in the U.S. District Court of Massachusetts. FBI agent Buckley is forced into retirement because of the corruption and under investigation for murder as he was an admitted partner of convicted murderer FBI agent John Connolly. FBI agent Callan was fired for choking out a federal prosecutor. Agent Morris received immunity but admitted to taking cash payoffs from Whitey Bulger and Stevie Flemmy. Newton gets fired for taking cash payoffs from Bulger and Flemmy. Agent Ring retires in the middle of his corruption case to avoid detection. And the assistant United States attorney, Dan Kottmeyer, then chief of the New England crime, uh, the New England organized crimes task force, who was involved in all of this bullshit is now a fucking superior court judge. Like I said, 1800 pages. I tried to make this as impactful as possible. This is what your FBI does. This is what fucking rats do. And I wanted to show you a case of a situation where the FBI didn't care. Just like the FBI didn't care in the Joey Merlino case. They didn't care what the fuck Rubio said. Just like they didn't care in the Phil Narducci case when a fucking terrorist here on an expired visa was doing what he did. This is not one and done. You look at every single fucking case and indictment we've ever talked. Anthony Persiano, wife beating, crackhead, piece of shit, scammed hundreds of, uh, well, not hundreds of millions, but millions of dollars from people who are never going to financially fucking ever recover. But because he's a protected rat, there's no civil liability for him. You want to keep going? You want to talk about other informants? They don't fucking ever goddamn tell me again they tell the truth. Because they all fucking lie. And I could have, and if you're interested in this case specifically, please go over to our podcast, Supercast. I'll put the link in the, in the, the fucking chat here. We are covering this particular case in depth. And we're getting on to Whitey Bulger this week because there's some very interesting shit there. This is all encompassing. So stop saying informants are changed. Stop saying. That they tell the truth. Because every single fucking inf- indictment I've ever covered on YouTube or on my podcast, we've caught the rat, rats and lies and malfeasance. And we've also caught the FBI. How many FBI agents in Joey Merlino's case got fired because of what Rubio did? 94 of 100, what was it? 94 of 114 days unsupervised, allowed to delete information as he saw fit. This is fucking ridiculous. The problem is there is no goddamn oversight. 
And that's the reality. And listen, I get it. The government has their narrative. They want to put guys in prison. I totally get it. And the only way you can do that is with informants. But those of you who are so fucking quick to fucking judge gangsters need to judge the rats too. Because there's two sides to every story. Well, there's really three. There's the rat side, the gangster side, and then there's the fucking truth. And some of you wouldn't know the fucking truth if it bit you in the fucking ass.